So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back after the summer holidays. I'm Tina Oeval, and I will be your host today. And uh, welcome to you, John. I'm looking so much forward to, to your talk today, because as I said, this is something that has been highly requested, both like online, but also when I have met some of you in, in the real world, because it seems to be something that everybody is struggling with. So I hope that you can give us some good pointers in uh, how to actually uh, solve these things. So from a previous point of view, we are, of course, very happy that so many people are joining again today. Again today. And I hope that you have had a lovely morning, not a lovely morning, a lovely day so far. But I have hope that you have had a lovely morning so far, John. Thank you. Um, John has over 40 years of experience in uh, various UX roles, and uh, you have inspired a lot of people uh, in different organizations throughout the world. Um, and you're also the author of the book, Navigating the Politics of UX. And I know that you are almost finishing up the, the next or the follow-up book for that one. So uh, do you know when that's out? I'm very curious. Well, I always say it's going to be out a certain month, and usually it's late. Um, yeah. But my expectation is November. Okay, so just before the Christmas shopping. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. I'll put that on the list for sure. So the agenda for today is that when I'm done with all these practicalities, John will start his talk. You can, as always, ask questions in the QA section here in Zoom, and we'll, we'll go through some of the questions at the end of the session. We are recording everything and you'll receive the recording of it, uh, I think, during the next week. And we uh, can also include John's slides, uh, slides in uh, that mail. And for those of you who do not know Preely, Preely is a self-service platform for unmoderated remote user testing and also of panel hosting. So you can actually host your own user panel on our platform as well. So if you is this is something that you're interested in. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the different solutions that we can provide you with, then please reach out and then we'll see what we can do. Um, I think that was all. So uh, I'll just say take away, John. All right. Thank you, Tina. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, to get to talk about some of the topics that are very near and dear to my heart, which is basically trying to get your your organization to be more user centric and to move up the maturity scale and user experience. In order to do that, a lot of times you need to make a, a very compelling business case. I've been at this quite a while, as Tina said, 40 years. Uh, I started back in 1982 with Hewlett Packard as a, actually as a technical writer, but I quickly realized that I couldn't write myself out of a problem that the pro, the, the team had designed itself into. So I really started doing design work fairly quickly after doing uh, technical writing, writing manuals and such. Um, in 1988 at HP, I got the opportunity to work for the corporate engineering department in California as a participant, as a consultant in a group called Design for the User. So we were tasked with going out to all the various divisions within HP all across the world and training them on user experience design methodologies and practices that we had developed. We had done a survey of the field and tried to take all the best information we could find from Donald Norman and uh, Jacob Nielsen and, and Cooper and all these various luminaries at the time in user experience design and try to make it pragmatic, try to make it fit within a large corporation that was very, uh, interested in getting things done quickly. You know, you've probably seen a lot of different ways of doing user experience design that would take months and months and months. We didn't have that. So we came up with our own pragmatic approach and taught it to everybody and consulted with everybody within HP. Then in um, 2000, I, I, 2002, I left HP and tried to start my own company called Total Customer Experience Labs. And uh, there I did additional training with other companies. I got to train Microsoft. I got to train IBM, a number of other companies there. But it was a recession, and I wasn't able to make, uh, make the rent or make the mortgage payment. So I went back into the corporate world with General Electric, GE, at their um, medical imaging division and worked for them for a short period of time. And during this stint, I got to, again, train people throughout the world at various GE locations 
in how user experience design could fit within the, uh, the culture within GE. In 2005, I went to United Health Group, spent three years there. Uh, United Health Group, if you're not familiar, is a United States-based insurance company, but they also have a, an IT department, a technology department that actually creates applications for patients. And so I worked in that group there. 2008, I went to Deloitte. I was able to lead a very large user experience group, very diverse, very um, located in India, located in the United States. And um, we were basically tasked with creating user experience designs for all of their IT applications that were used by Deloitte consultants. My last corporate job was with Edmentum. Edmentum is a education technology company. We created um, applications for teachers, for administrators, and for students, as well as lessons for students, content for students, and worked there for seven years as the director of user experience. I'll talk more about that as we move through this uh, talk here today. 2020, I finally got to go out on my own again. I, I formed Colorado Design Labs and wrote the book, um, Navigating the Politics of UX, then, which came out in January of this year. So that's a little bit about my history. Uh, we're going to be talking about business cases, right? And the way that it is often presented to people is by giving them statistics. You go to your, your C-suite and you say, here are all the compelling statistical research that's been done that shows that user experience design is going to be um, valuable to our profit and loss. So you see things like this, right? Loyal customers are work up, worth up to 10 times as much as after their first purchase. Um, news of bad customer service reaches more than twice as many year, years as good experience. Uh, every customer who bothers to complain, 26 others remain silent. 12 positive experiences make up one unsolved negative experience. So you would expect if you were able to supply your CEO and all the uh, the vice presidents in your company with these this kind of data that they would jump up and say, you've got us, you've convinced us, we should definitely be investing in user experience design and research. We'll give you an unlimited budget for research. You can go out and whatever kinds of experience initiatives you can come up with then we will support them. It doesn't work that way because statistics are only compelling to user experience professionals, right? They put everybody else to sleep. It's not going to be a reason why your CEO is going to say, all of a sudden, we're going to really listen to our user experience designers. And if they tell us that we're providing a, a subpar experience, we're going to fix that before we put it out to our customers. Another approach is user empathy, right? When we go out, we have empathy for our customers when we're doing our research. When I was working for Edmentum, I got to go to a classroom and observe the teachers um, helping the children use one of our applications. And all their hands were in the air. All the teachers were being run all across this classroom responding to the kids who, who were asking for help because they could not get our application to work. It was crashing, they didn't know how to navigate it. It was all kinds of uh, problems like that. And it was just a disaster for the teacher. So we had empathy for them. We had empathy for the kids, we had empathy for the teachers. But if you go up and expect your CEO and your vice presidents to have that same level of empathy, they're not gonna do that. They're going to be accountable for profit and loss. So their concern is, can I make money for my shareholders? Can I convince the board of directors that our, our um, income trajectory is going in the right direction? That sort of thing. So they have a whole different way of measuring success than we do. So in order to be successful in making the business case for user experience, it's going to take time. It's going to take patience. You're not going to be able to get up and make one presentation to your C-suite and have them suddenly agree that um, you know, you've made your business case and UX is now going to be a central part of our culture. In order to do that, there are five principles that you must perform over time. The first one is you've got to tell stories. 
not statistics, not data. You've got to be able to tell a story around the statistics and the data that the, that the C-suite is going to find compelling. The second principle is that you've got to prove that the ROI is going to be there for me. The CEO needs to understand that before I take a risk on, on assigning developers to a, a user experience initiative that you have in mind, to actually spending money on getting this performed and getting this done, you're going to have to show me that I'm going to get a decent return on investment and that I can take that return on investment to my board and say, you know, I made the right decision here. It's helped us to be more successful. The third principle is uh, you've got to recruit allies. You can't do this alone. And if you do try to do it alone, it's going to really um, hurt you more than it's going to help you. And I'll talk a lot more about that as we move forward. The fourth principle is you've got to share the credit with your allies. You can't be the hero of the organization. I have been the hero of the organization and all it does is cause you grief because everyone else is going to resent you for it. So even if you know there's an old saying that says, you know, you succeeded when the uninvolved take credit, that's okay. You got to keep your focus on the idea that I am trying to provide our users with the best experience as possible. Wherever that comes from, whatever that idea comes from, I'm going to support that as long as we reach that goal. And then the fifth principle is that you've got to help others succeed, okay? You have to understand what their metrics are, how they're measured, what their drivers are, what keeps them up at night. And you've got to say, this is how user experience can help you with that. It can help you make your revenue targets. It can help you uh, reduce your costs. It can help you in all these different ways. So let's dig into these a little bit more. Telling stories. Preaching doesn't work. I've tried it. Believe me, it doesn't work. When I was at General Electric, we would make this presentation that would talk about why user-centered design is critical to our success as a company. And we talk about you know, all the, the traditional arguments that are true, right? And that we care about and that we believe in and try to make other people believe in them too. But it, it doesn't work. It, at the end of the presentation, you'll get a lot of nods and they'll say, yeah, you're right. This is really a good idea. But then people are gonna go back and do whatever they were doing before the presentation. Teaching doesn't work either. When I was with at Deloitte, um, I taught this course. It was a mandatory course. Everybody in the um, department had to take it called RUUX. I know that's a stupid title, but my boss made it up, so I had to use it. But it basically talked about the process of user experience design. You know, what is it? Why do you do it? What are the governing dynamics between user product communication and, and collaboration? How do you do research? How do you analyze the research you've done? How do you use that to design better experiences? Didn't work. People were entertained by the presentation. They went away, I think, with a better understanding of what user experience is all about. But did it change their behaviors? Did it change their willingness to invest money in this? No, it didn't. What you need to do is you've got to tell a story and the story needs to be illustrated and it needs to be animated. So when I was with um, Adventum, we came out with this idea that we're gonna stop using the word user as soon as we can. Yes, you've got to use it sometimes, but after you know who your real users are and what role they play, then you can start using that terminology. So instead of using, um, this is a MRI. This is a a user. You would say this is an MRI technician at General Electric. In Edmonton, instead of saying this is a user, you'd say this is a teacher. Instead of saying this is a uh, user, you would say, oh, this is an audio file that cares about music. If I'm designing music applications, if it's a um, user experience designer, you call them a user experience designer instead of a pre the user, for instance. So it just makes the, the, the people that you're talking about less abstract. So get out of the, the, the habit of, of calling people users the entire time. What we then did is take these personas, right, these teachers at uh, Edmonton, and we'd, we'd give them a name. Ken Schneider is the administrator of the school. 
here's his profile, here are his primary goals. And this is part of a vision prototype that we put together. I can't show you the interactivity of it right now, but we were telling this entire story as a way of communicating a vision for what our applications needed to be like in the future. So we would start with a person that we were designing for. And we'd say, this person is going to have school starting next month, and it's going to be time to set up the Admentum Outcomes platform for the school year, right? And so there's Ken's school. And then Ken sets it up, and this is what comes out, he presses a button and suddenly everything is synced up. All the students are put into their classes and the teachers are ready to teach. And so then you talk about the first day of school and you talk about Lisa Sandy, who is now a teacher who comes in to start teaching for her first day. She's a middle school math teacher. She's been teaching for eight years. She's looking to get her kids to pass those state assessments. And then you show how you're going to help her succeed as well. So this was just a, a segment of this entire story that we told from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year with real people as the players in the story. So we had the administrator, we had the teachers, and we had the students. The second principle, you've got to prove ROI for me. It's personal, right? I'm held accountable for certain return on investment investments that we make. So what are you going to do for me? This was a hard lesson for me to learn when I was with HP. I once got the opportunity to speak with a uh, vice president, okay? And I, I had this presentation that I gave him about this initiative that I wanted to start and would he support it and would he give us investment to do the research and all this sort of thing. And he looked at me after the presentation was done and he said, well, good initiative, John. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back and get me data. I want you to get me proof that if I give you the money, if I invest in this, that I'm going to get a positive return on investment. I called it at the time, the Wizard of Oz challenge because it was like, yeah, I'll take you back to Kansas, but first you've got to bring me the broom from the Wicked Witch of the West, which was all the data that he expected me to get. And at the time I thought, come on, isn't this obvious that this is the right thing to do for people? You know, it's the empathetic thing to do for our users, but that wasn't enough. He needed data, he needed return on investment data. So when I learned the lesson from this, I went to Admentum and we had a product called Study Island and it, it was old, okay? It had evolved uh, over 10, 15, 20 years with new uh, features being added all the time. And it was just stale. It was just hard to use. This was what it looked like at the beginning, okay? So we redesigned it and came up with this uh, new uh, at front end to it called Sensei, uh, which was much more visually compelling and much easier to navigate. And, but that wasn't enough, right? What we were able to do was to show through research and data that if we gave users the option of using the old user interface or the new Sensei user interface, that the ones that chose to use Sensei were 60% more likely to renew their contract with Admentum than those who use the old interface. So there was return on investment data. We actually could show that we were responsible for hundreds of renewals that would not have otherwise happened had they had we not done the redesign. Okay, principle three, you must recruit allies. This is absolutely key. And I spend the first part of my book talking about how to recruit allies in all the different functional areas. Because you may think, oh, well, I work with development. I work with maybe the product owner or the product manager. And those are the key uh, colleagues or allies that I have that I work with in getting my designs implemented. But you should work with sales, you should work with support, you should work with marketing, you should work with all these different other functional areas that you might not have had any kind of relationship with before because you can help them succeed and they can help you succeed. I learned this again uh, when I was with HP when I was working for corporate engineering, I would go to these 
uh, divisions within HP, and you know, they didn't invite me. I just came out there say, I, I need to have a meeting with you. And I say, hi, you know, the joke was, it was like we were coming in and saying, hi, I'm from corporate, and I'm here to help you, right? Who was I to say that I could help them? I didn't understand their business domain. I didn't understand their users. I hadn't done any research on their users. They knew what they were talking about a lot more than I did. So how could I possibly help them? So you need to make allies of them. And the way I eventually did this was to do a listening tour. Whenever I started a new job, even if you're not starting a new job, go spend a half an hour just listening to all of the these people in these various functional areas. Go to the support manager or go to the support people who are manning the phones uh, in your call center. And just listen to them say, what kind of things are you experiencing? How does user experience? How could it help you if we were to improve it? What sort of problems are you seeing in your job because the user experience is not as good as it could be? What keeps you up at night? Those sorts of things. And you just listen to them. And they're going to give you lots and lots of good ideas about how UX and that functional area could partner together to try to improve, improve things. The other way to recruit allies is to engage them in field research, okay? Don't just go out on your own, do your research, come back and report it, right? That's stale. Uh, we did a lot of observational research in Edmentum, and we would always invite the developers to come along with this, or the product owner or the product manager. And so they could see firsthand what we were seeing about what was it about our products that was working well, what wasn't working well. What ideas do the teachers have for how we could make it work better? And this way you get this common understanding, this baseline understanding of what the user experience is all about. And they become your allies as a result of that. So that when you propose an initiative, when you propose that this particular element of the user experience needs to change, you've got allies out there that have seen the problem firsthand and are gonna support you on that and hopefully make that initiative that you're proposing rise to the top of the, the product roadmap. I once had an experience at HP with this. Um, I was working with the uh, oscilloscope group at HP and I would go to them and I'd say, you know, your product's really hard to use. And they'd say, well, it's hard to use because it's inherently complex what we're doing here, okay? Our audience is scientists and engineers, and uh, they're used to complexity. And in fact, they'd be actually um, offended if, if we made this easier to use because they appreciate complexity. And then they would tell me, well, yeah, it's hard, but it's not rocket science. And so that was their line. Yeah, it's complex, but it's not rocket science. It could be a lot worse. And they felt that way until we actually went on a customer visit to Los Alamos National Laboratory. This is a place that employs a lot of rocket scientists. And we talked to them and they said, you know, we don't have time to learn how to use your products anymore. We're really busy. Uh, it needs to be simpler. And so this was a way of, again, engaging others getting them involved and making allies out of them by taking them along on user research visits and getting them to hear firsthand from the customer, from the user that, you know, maybe we're not as good as we thought we were and, and we should do something to improve that. Principle number four, you must share credit, okay? I, uh, I worked underground when I first started with Edmentum. Um, I had this idea, and I'll talk a lot more about this here in a minute, that uh, there was this really dramatic way, which became Sensei, that we could improve the user experience for our products. Rather than um, try to enlist allies and understand how they measured success and, and how we could help them, I worked underground, uh, meaning that I started doing my research. I didn't share the research. I um, started building a prototype of a solution that I thought would work. And then um, I exposed it to others. Okay, this prototype, this fully built 
solution that I had for this problem that I had identified. This triggered the corporate immune system. Okay, my colleagues, my partners in product development said, well, this is not invented here. I had nothing to do with this. You didn't talk to me. I've been at this company a lot longer than you. I understand our customers better than you. Who are you to come in and tell us that this is the solution to a problem, right? In other cases, they would they would say, well, we've tried this, you know, or, or we proposed this idea that you're talking about and it didn't go anywhere. So, you know, it, it just needs to die. They were all up in arms. They were saying, why, why, you know, this is, actually what I did was a real big mistake. I actually sold this idea to the C-suite before I went to my colleagues. And so they were resentful of me because here I was again, being the hero, right? I, this new guy comes in, he comes up with this great idea. We're going to run with it. But I did not involve the development manager, the product owner, the product manager, and so on. And so they were just completely against me. And it took me months in order to repair those relationships. So that's why you got to share the credit, which is strange because I had done that before when I was with HP. And this is kind of dating myself, right? But one of the uh, one of the divisions at HP that I worked for was the, the compiler division. The, and at the time, we we sold a Fortran compiler. If you, you may not even know what Fortran is, but it was an early programming language. Okay, and we had done re some research. We found out that this command line, which you see in kind of this bluish purple box there, uh, had all these switches in it, uh, which is the minus A, lowercase r, uppercase M and et cetera. And all these switches control the behavior of the compiler. And we had probably a hundred pages in our Fortran manual that described exactly what these switches did and how to use them. Of course, nobody read the manual. And uh, so as a result, all the investment the development team made in creating all of these controls didn't get used at all. And so, we came up with a solution. We said, well, manuals don't work. Writing about them doesn't work. We got to design something that is a solution, not just document the problem. And so we came up with what we called Fortran Smart Options. And we worked with the development team in order to come up with this thing. So that instead of typing this cryptic list of switches, we would have a graphical user interface that covered over it, the compiler, and they could just check off behaviors that they wanted for this particular compilation of this one program. And this was a great success. And we shared that success with the developers so that when it came time uh, where this became promoted, when we actually kind of got an award for doing this within the, the, the division, um, we were able to share that credit with our development team. OK, so. Now I wanna to try to pull all this together in a story where I took all of these five principles and put them to use and actually was able to make a huge change in the corporate maturity of the company that I joined, okay? So actually, I'm not gonna do that yet. I'm gonna do principle five, sorry, skipped, skipped ahead. You must help others succeed. So this is, I get a lot of pushback on this. I once put out a, a posting on LinkedIn saying, yeah, you know, you, UX is everybody's job. And all these people said, yeah, I agree with that. And another set of people said, this is BS. You know, I'm so tired of people telling me that they can do my job and that I'm, you know, the user experience is just something that you really don't need to be a professional about. Everybody can do it. But consider this. If your application is online, offline, you know, it's down, right? Isn't that a UX issue? Isn't that affecting the user experience? If there's a paper jam in your printer, isn't that a UX issue? If your order processing process is complex and lengthy, isn't that a UX issue as well? If your support staff can't resolve user problems when they call the call center, isn't that also a user usability issue? If your warranty return policy is rigid and perceived as unfair, 
if your cost of ownership is out of line with your competitors, if your sales process nickel and dimes customers for everything, if your marketing uses dark patterns that deceive customers, all of these are user experience issues. And this is why we need to understand that we share responsibility for the user experience with the entire set of functional departments within the company. This doesn't mean we don't do design, right? But what it means is we understand how to do research. We understand how to take that research and analyze it. We understand how to turn that analysis into solutions. We understand how to iterate on those solutions. We understand how to validate those solutions with customers and so on. These are skills that we can share and consult with the other functional areas who do not have the same skill set. Yeah, we, we still do do the brunt of the design work and the brunt of the research work, but our approach to understanding the customer and designing for that understanding is something that we can inspire others to do. So our job is not just to put out a user interface or a workflow that improves the user experience, our job is also to educate the rest of the company on the ways that you can do this. The ways, our, our job is to influence the rest of the company and inspire the rest of the company and engage the rest of the company to provide the best possible user experience that we can to our customers. It helps us break down silos when we do this. This is always a problem within companies where everybody feels like that they have their job description, they have their boundaries, and don't you cross into my boundaries. You know, I do product research. You shouldn't be doing user research. Sometimes you get that. Sometimes I've heard that the sales team doesn't want you to go out with them because they're afraid you're going to tell them or promise something to them that uh, you won't be able to deliver down the line. You want to break down those silos by going out and engaging with all these different functional areas, bringing them along with the research, bringing them into the ideation sessions, bringing them into the iterations and sharing your thought process about how you came up with this particular solution so that these silos break down. One way we did this was uh, we, we decided that um, the support costs for Admentum, again, going back to that, were really high. We had lots of people calling, trying to get uh, instructions on how to, to operate our applications. And so we worked with the support manager, director, uh, to come up with in-product support. Instead of having this separate source of information on the phones or a knowledge system that was out there that, that um, the educators could access, we decided we would embed this support information into the products themselves. So we created this help center where the users could get step-by-step -step guidance, where they could get on-demand resources, where they could get learn and support, go to a website that actually had training videos and, and PDFs and user guides and all the other ancillary support information written in a way that they can understand and easy to access through the product itself. And then ways of, of putting out alerts and getting feedback from customers as well. So this was an, an example of where we were able to collaborate uh, with the support team to come up with a solution. We both worked on it. We both co-authored this in support, in product support system. And it was, a, again, a big success. So now I'm gonna apply these principles. The most effective way that I have found to actually move an organization up the, user experience maturity scale is by coming up with a breakthrough project and measure its financial impact. You can't just come up with a great idea, implement the idea and never prove, never prove its ROI, never actually get the data that you need to show that you had a financial impact because it's all about that. I mean, the only reason we have jobs and everybody else has jobs at this company is because they think that uh, investing in, uh, in us is going to actually improve their, their revenue, their profit and loss. Okay, so you've probably seen um, the Nielsen-Norman groups 
user maturity model, UX maturity model. It's been revised recently. It used to have, I think, eight different stages to it. Now it's got six. And here are the six different stages, absent, limited, emergent, structured, integrated, and user-driven. When I started with Admentum, I was the first user experience employee at the company. They had no designers. They had no user experience research. They, I was the first person they brought in as the director for this. So they were somewhere between level two and three, limited and emergent. They understood that user experience was important and that if they didn't start investing in it, they would be falling behind their competitors. But at the same time, there was no process. There was no investment in research. There was no um, structure to it whatsoever. It wasn't part of the culture, certainly. And so this is where I started when I started at Admentum. So I did my listening tour. I went out and I talked to all these directors of all these different functional areas and found out what kept them up at night. But I also did a listening tour with our customers. I asked, you know, who can you put me in touch with that is actually going out and physically visiting customers on a regular basis? And it turns out we had what we called implementation specialists. And they did all the customer training, on-site training for customers. So I asked to go along. I went to this one, one uh, site. It was a, um, a site in Texas in the United States. And um, I just watched this uh, implementation specialist give training to these two, two ladies who were running this, uh, this company or this, uh, this part of the uh, education system there. Here's what they told me. They said, you know, I have to choose administration, which is a button on the screen. And then I have to choose the class button. And then I have to choose the student button. And it just seems like it's longer and convoluted than it needs to be. I just want to be able to click on a student and have a choice of things that I can do with that student. I can edit the student. I can delete the student. I can manage the student's hours or whatever. That's just an idea. So this is a direct quote from what she told us she was doing. And they had actually just received training on our application one week earlier. But by the time they actually had to sit down and try to use the product themselves without anybody holding their hand, they forgot what to do. So she said, she had just told us last week how to do this. This was she being the training specialist. And then it comes time a few days later to actually do it. And we're both like, it's gone. And this is why we're having this meeting to write some notes down. So they were creating a cheat sheet that they could use whenever they wanted to perform some function, some action, like edit a student, delete a student, manage a student's hours, so that they wouldn't remember the, the workflow that they needed to follow in order to achieve that. This was an example of a teacher, not a user, a teacher telling me exactly what they needed and exactly what the solution be, would be, exactly what the UX project should be to address this complaint. So I went back to the office and I decided I needed to solve this problem. Because if I could solve this problem, I would be creating a, a brand new experience for our customers, one that really had empathy for them, one that really gave them what they were asking for. And this is where I started working underground, which was a mistake. So I did this analysis, right? And the reason that the, this lady was telling me this is because they called our application the clicky system. Uh, because it didn't look like anything that they were used to as classroom teachers. All it was was a bunch of buttons and menu items and stuff like that on the screen. And they had to start at the home page and they had to navigate to another page and to another page and to another page and to another page until they finally got down to the thing that they were trying to accomplish, the result that they were trying to achieve. Okay. So this was the, the core, the root of the problem. And here's what it looked like when I, I first started at, at Admentum. You know, 
here are all the actions you might want to do, create a class, create a learner, assign courses, et cetera. And then across the top of the screen, classes, assignments, content, reports. But again, the teacher said, I want to see my students and do whatever it is I, I need to do with that particular student, not all these abstractions. And so what we realized, or what I realized at the time, was in order to give the teacher what she asked for, we need to make our application look like a reflection of the educator's world. So when she looked at our application, she saw her classroom, not a bunch of buttons and menus, she saw students. We call this the My World Design. And so this is what we came up with. You look at, at this new application front end now, and you see Maria Alvarez and Rachel Albert and me and then Kim Charles and all these people, all these students that I have in my classroom. And I can see the basic information that I need about each of these students, their last login, how long they worked, their last activity, what was the lesson they, that they were trying to perform and learn from. Um, I could see if they were inactive. I could see if they sent me a message that I needed to respond to. I could see if there was something that they needed to have graded, uh, that I needed to grade. Um, I could see whether they're online now working and you know, can I instant message them? Um, so this was an entirely new experience for the, for the educators, one that they actually requested, one that this was a design that they had actually asked for. So the reason that this was important is because if you look at the way applications and products evolve over time, specifically talking about software now, when they start out with version 1.0, they are pretty simple to use. They don't have a lot of features and functionality built into them. This is kind of the minimal viral, viable product kind of thing in Agile. Right. But then over time, as each new release comes out, the features and their power and their capability increases, but so does the complexity. Because over time, the design framework that we came up with, when we were only working with a few features, um, it, it, it outgrows that. All right. Uh, you start just patching on new features, trying to find places for them, and it becomes harder to navigate, becomes harder to use. So at some point, the effort required to navigate the application and learn the application and understand the application and get the results you want with the application, uh, the effort exceeds the value. And so what are we going to do about that? Well, if you don't have any UX at all, it's just going to go straight up to that that level where you've got lots of feature, features, but uh, it's gonna be very complex. But what you can do and what a lot of companies do and what I've done in a lot of companies I work for is incrementally improve the user experience. So when version 11.0 comes out, it's a little better. We, we've picked a particular feature or aspect of the user experience that is particularly onerous and we've improved it, right? And then the next time we improve something else and the next time we've proven something else. And eventually, over time, if we're lucky, we get back to the point where the effort doesn't exceed the value of the application. Because when the effort exceeds value, you're going to find people not renewing their contracts because they're going to say, wow, this was so hard to use. There's got to be something out there that's better and easier than this. So we needed to get below that line. What Sensei did is once we got to the point where the effort exceeded value, we came up with a new design paradigm. We made the simplicity a dis disruptive element of the application. And what we were able to do is retain all the features and power and capability of the application, but dramatically simplify it so that it went down there. Now, this isn't easy to do, but it can be done. And this is what got the attention of the organization. This is why I'm telling you this kind of a breakthrough design was able to mobilize the entire organization behind this thing. So when I was making the presentation, I was able to get the CEO excited. And he said, well, this is a whole new product. We're going to do this. You know, So all the development resources and such were assigned to it. But I also got marketing involved because they wanted to name it something. So they came up with this name of Sensei, right? 
and I got support behind it because, wow, if we can do this, we could really reduce our support costs because we won't have as many people calling trying to figure out how do I navigate down to this uh, particular area of the screen or application that I need to get the result that I'm after. And development, love doing this, honestly. You know, sometimes development says, wow, you're coming up with this crazy idea. Yeah, it's really easy to make a prototype of it, but it's really hard to, to develop it. But they enjoyed the challenge. I, I have to give credit to this development team. They wanted to do something that was novel. They wanted to learn to do some new things. And so they were behind it as well. So we got the whole organization mobilized to get this done. And then again, you got to measure the success, right? So what we did is we built this prototype of the application and we gave it to our, our sales team and we called it a release preview. So long, you know, months before this thing was actually going to be released, we um, got it out there to people and the salespeople could show it to people and the customers who were saying, well, you know, we have this old stale application. They said, wow, you guys are really innovating here. We're going to stay with you. We're going to renew our contract. So that was a big win. So everybody in the organization, all the CEOs, all the C-suite applauded this effort. Eventually, I did learn that I can't do it all by myself. And we all shared the credit for it. So after this, the, we had this breakthrough in uh, user experience maturity in the organization. We went up to user-driven because of this one breakthrough project. So if you'd like to know more about this um, breakthrough project, if you go out to Smashing Magazine, I put an article out there uh, a month or two ago, which describes in detail exactly how this entire process worked. So if you wanna go out and take a look at that, you can. Uh, another additional resource you can look at is um, I've got a recording of a keynote presentation that I did for the 24 Hours of UX uh, conference a few months ago, uh, where I talk about dispelling the seven deadly myths of user experience design. Uh, this is a section in my book, um, and but I talk about it uh, and get a lot of stories behind uh, how we actually identified these myths that were preventing us from being a, a UX mature organization and how we dispelled them. And then finally, you know, there's this book, my book that's come out now. Um, it's part four of this book is about making the business case. It has a lot of other approaches to making the business case that I have not talked about here. Uh, but it's also got a section at the very beginning on recruiting allies in each functional area, how to identify what support cares about, what marketing cares about, what development cares about, what uh, salespeople care about and so on, and how you can relate to that and show them how UX can help them. And then finally, coming this fall is volume two of Navigating the Politics of UX. This is gonna be focused on operations. Um, I'm going to provide you with a, a methodology, a mindset, and some models of user product communication and collaboration that uh, I started developing at HP and have continued to develop. And then I talk about the day-to-day -day, um, things that come up as a user experience designer or researcher um, and how to handle those situations. So there's a section on research operations, one on design operations, one on development operations. I leave you with um, a reference to this website here. It's called the intrapreneur.com. Notice the I, it's not entrepreneur, it's intrapreneur. And this guy, uh, Gifford Pinchot the third came up with these 10 commandments. If you're going to be an innovator inside a company and not outside a company, not creating your own company. And some of the ones that I like, you know, things that I've talked about, right? Number two, share credit widely. Uh, one that I like is um, number eight, come into work each day willing to be fired, right? Sometimes you have to be uh, bold uh, to get some of these things done. And then the other one is, um, you know, number four, they're under promise, but over deliver. Publicity triggers the corporate immune system. This is why I do believe sometimes you have to work underground to get things started. 
but I worked underground way too long. I shouldn't have gone directly to the C-suite. I should have worked underground, got a half-baked prototype together for Sensei, and then engaged my partners in, in the development team and design team uh, to help me refine that and then presented it together with them to the C-suite. So I learned from that. Um, so finally, just never stop asking what's next. That's what user experience is all about. We're never going to reach the ultimate optimal user experience. You know, if you look at it, the applications we have today that are built around the GUI model and menus and buttons and stuff like that, that's not the best solution. There's going to be something else like now we're getting into voice, now we're getting into AI, now we're getting into other applications. So never stop asking what will be coming next. Never be satisfied with what you're doing today. And with that, Thank you for your attention and um, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Um, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm just so happy because like, I feel like I've found my spirit animal because a lot of the topics you touch upon, I have been there. I have yeah. been advocating, I've been teaching, I have run into the corporate immune system so many times and I'm so happy that I have a word for it now, to be honest. <laughs> great. So that's great. So if you have any questions, pop them into the QA section. Um, I have I, I, yeah, I have a lot of questions actually. So um, you're talking about like these to, uh, that we must provide um, return of investment for like people yep. want the return of investments for them. And I know very often when I speak to UX designers in general, they are saying, yeah, a lot of people are asking me for this. And a lot of people are also being measured on other KPIs than I am. So I'm here to actually make the best uh, possible uh, experience for the customers, but the ones that are actually making the decision for the product are just uh, being measured on if the if the product are launched is launched or not. So yes. so do you have like some ideas how can we actually bridge that gap because I see, see that as a huge issue when it comes to the product development. Yeah, that's really hard, especially as companies start to adapt and adopt the agile approach to. Yeah. Software right because it's all about how fast can i get stuff out there what is the velocity of the features that we're building and so on mm -hmm. um over time what we were able to do at admentum is we got the first of all we basically created a small separate team to work on sensei okay so they were not responsible for feeding the development agile machine okay they could work they could iterate they could continue to do research until we finally had it done so if you have the luxury where you can carve off uh, a designer and a prototyper or something like that to and a researcher to work on this great breakthrough project that you have in mind and still have another group that is feeding the machine and keeping the agile machine working that can help a lot but over time, what we were able to do is get the user experience team to operate out of phase with the development team. So we would actually be working three months ahead, a little bit at a time, you know, two weeks ahead, four weeks ahead, yeah. um, to the point where now we were visualizing and prototyping ideas that we wanted to build in, you know, six months from now. And get them get the development team we still had to keep them going it was hard because you know you've got to support the development team there's always things that you design that can't be implemented so you're going to make changes to it and so on but we were able to get mostly out of phase with development so that we had more time to innovate and prototype and iterate and research and get things done um in in the book i do talk about ways of putting user experience initiatives in context to other demands that the, the company may have, such as getting things out on time, right? Because sometimes you can actually get things out on time, but it's a terrible experience. We all, we, we had that happen at Admentum where we put out uh, this brand new product, but we put it out too early and people were returning it, right? So you have all these costs of returns. You have all this bad uh, publicity and reputation that is generated from putting this stuff out. So if you can quantify that and make that case that, yeah, we could get it out on time, but it could ruin us because our customers are going to abandon us in, in mass, then sometimes you can get people to 
slow down a little bit and say, well, it's better to take another month to fix this than uh, to wait. And just one more story there. Uh, there was a disk drive manufacturer and they were going to put out this new disk drive. Um, it was a aftermarket disk drive uh, just before the Christmas holidays. And that's a big sales season for them. People would buy them. Um, they understood that installing, they did a test and they found out that installing and configuring the drive was almost impossible and the documentation didn't work. So the CEO courageously delayed missing the, the Christmas holiday because he knew if you put it out early, the day after Christmas, people would be lining up at the store returning the product and that would yeah. be more costly than waiting. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, because that's it, it's a huge issue. And I know that like, yeah, every time I speak with people, that's an issue. So yeah, it, it's just something like a knot that we need to crack in a way and also make ourselves like show, like you've also said that a couple of times, like, like be able to show the value and actually also be able to measure the value of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I have like, I have so many questions, but UX maturity, I've worked a lot with UX maturity previously in another career almost, right? How did you actually do that going from like a bit over two to six? Because as I recall it, like especially like in the old models from Nelson Norman, they are saying that, okay, each level or each stage takes like a couple of oh, years. Yeah. So how did you actually accelerate that? Or did you actually take like these eight or 10 years that it, as it normally will take to make that huge jump? Well, I've had both. And if you look at that Smashing Magazine article, yeah. I talk about the other experiences that I've had where it did take years or it did take months. Yeah. And move the needle up the scale, if at all, right? And you don't always move up the scale and stay there. Sometimes you move up and then a new oh. you know leader comes into the company and you just crash, you know, go yeah. go back down. But this this one instance where again the breakthrough project, if you can come up with something that's so bold and so new that you get the entire organization excited about it. And it's not just this incremental, oh, yeah, we improved this. That was big. You know, customers are not telling us anything. It hasn't increased sales. It hasn't increased revenue. It's just made things a little bit easier. That doesn't get the company excited. But if you can get this bold breakthrough project together, in my experience, that is the best way to accelerate going up the maturity scale. Yeah. Um, I think like, oh, we could talk for hours about that, but I like, oh yeah, time is unfortunately up, but I think it's so interesting. And I think it's just, it's just so nice to hear that, like, it seems that we're in the same boat, everybody, right? That we have the same issues, like both with the maturity stuff, but also with the, like have the buy-in for actually having a budget and also like having time to actually conduct real and great UX and usability work. So it seems, and we also discussed that before we actually went live here, that also just being able to pitch what we're doing is such, it's so, so, so difficult. And for me, I've been in this game for, for, I think 15 years, right? It's just so, it's actually nice to hear somebody with your experience, like experiencing the same. So it's not just us that is just left behind here. Yeah. So it's just so complex, right? It's very complex. Uh, yeah. user experience is very difficult to communicate to others. That's yeah. why you need to engage them so they become part of it. They recognize their par part exactly. in the experience designed for customers. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, unfortunately, time is up. But again, thank you so much for a very ins inspiring talk. I think uh, I have a lot of, I have new words for sure to both describe what I'm doing, but also describe some of the struggles that we are, we are fighting against. So um, I'll just say that for you behind the screen, we are recording everything, as I said in the beginning, and you will receive the recording like during the next week or so, and also John's slides. And uh, if you're interested in hearing more about Preli, like uh, um, both the opportunity of hosting your own user panels, but also remote unmoderated testing, then reach out and then uh, we'll definitely see what we can do and if it's something for you. If you have any topics that you're just like so eager to hear something about during our meetups, let us know. And also if you have some speakers where you're just like, oh, it would be so inspiring to have this person give a talk, let us know as well. And then we'll see what we can do. So uh, I think that was it. So John, again, thank you so much for joining us today Thanks and uh, have a great day. Like you're just starting. So, and we are just like almost yeah. finishing our work day. So yeah, that's uh, that's great.
right. so i'll just say yeah thank you for now thank you for joining and uh, have a great day and a great evening everyone so uh, bye 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 now